God's mercy. Number one, I want you to remember this. Write it down as you have to, because I'll probably say it more than once. It keeps us from getting what we deserve. And you know what that is. Keeps us from going to hell. All right? Now, God's grace, it gives us what we do not deserve. Because there's nobody here that deserves to go to heaven. None of us do. But by God's grace, we're going to go. All right? We're going to go. And that's God's grace. And that's what we're going to have in our message today is God's grace. And if you want to write it down, this is on Romans 3, 23 through 28. I'll read them to you right quick. It says, 323 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiatory by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the, time, at the present time so that he might be just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That's us, who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By law of works? No. No. There's nothing you can do to work your way into heaven. The only way you can get there is by the law of faith. Amen. All right. There's a little introduction we're going to talk. You know, when a person works an eight-hour day and receives a fair day's pay for that day, for his time, that's called a wage, right? You make wages. When a person competes with opponents and receives a trophy for his performance, that's a prize, Okay? And when a person receives appropriate recognition for his long service or high achievements, that is an award. Okay. But when a person is not capable of earning a wage, can win no prize, and deserves no award, yet receives such a gift anyway, that is a good picture of God's grace. It is. And that's God's unmerited favor. This is what we mean when we talk about the grace of God, his unmerited favor, because we don't deserve it. None of us do. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little story that I read. It, uh, I picked this up for this because it's a good little story. It's, I think most of you have heard of LaGuardia Airport in New York. Okay. LaGuardia was the mayor of New York City during the worst days of the Great Depression and all of World War II. He was called by adoring New Yorkers as the little flower. And that's because he was real short, five foot four, and he always wore a carnation in his lapel. He was a very colorful character who used to ride the New York City fire trucks. He did that. <laughs> he went with the police department on raids to the speakeasies. And he took entire orphanages to the baseball games. And whenever the police, uh, whenever the New York pa newspapers were on strike, he would go on the radio and read the comics to the kids. Now, wasn't that sweet of him? Good man. <clears throat> One bitterly cold night in January of 1935, the mayor turned up at the night court that served the poorest ward of the city. LaGuardia dismissed the judge for the evening and took over the court. Well, within a few minutes, a tattered old woman was brought before him, charged with stealing a loaf of bread. She told LaGuardia that her daughter's husband had deserted them, and her daughter was sick, and her two grandchildren were starving. But the shopkeeper from whom the bread was stolen refused to drop the charges. He said, it's a real bad neighborhood, Your Honor. The man told him, and he said that she's got to be punished to teach other people around here a lesson. LaGuardia sighed. He turned to the woman and said, I've got to punish you. 
The law makes no exceptions. Ten dollars or ten days in jail. But even as he pronounced the sentence, in 1935, ten dollars was a lot of money, people. Okay? All right. Said no exceptions. The mayor was already reaching into his pocket and extracted the bill and throwed it in his sombrero and said, uh, he said, here's a $10 fine, which I now remit. And furthermore, I am going to find everyone in this courtroom 50 cents for living in a city where a person has to steal bread so that their grandchildren can eat. Mr. Bailiff, collect the fines and give them to the defendant. Wow, that's pretty cool. So anyway, he collected them. So the following day, the newspaper, the New York City newspaper reported that $47.50 was turned over to a bewildered old lady who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed her starving grandchildren. 50 cents of that amount, uh, amount being contributed by the red-faced grocery store owner while some 70 petty criminals, people with traffic violations, New York City policemen, each of which had just paid 50 cents for this privilege of doing so, they all gave the mayor a standing ovation. Every one of them, even the store owner, brought tears to their eyes. Note, the woman was guilty now. She was guilty. She was sentenced, yet the judge, oh, I got you drunk. <laughs> but uh, the judge provided the means of redeeming her, and her debt was paid in full. Further, LaGuardia's act of showing grace not only provided for the debt, but gave the woman a great blessing in providing more than just the fine. Now, grace is a Greek word, charis, and the Hebrew word, chin. Grace means unmerited favor. It's a, it is merit shown someone who is undeserving of favor. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, I'm going to read this out of the Bible. It says, for the grace you have been saved through, uh, wait a minute, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not for a result of works so that one may boast. Okay, suppose the old woman had uh, refused the mayor's help. Suppose she responded in pride and said she did not want anyone's charity. The redemption from the crime would have been received, the penalty would stand, and she would go to jail. Her daughter and grandchildren would be left to starve, but guilty as she was, she accepted the gift and received the blessing that the mayor intended to it to be. Now, that's wonderful. I also read an article in this same deal that said, uh, explained that in Pennsylvania some years ago, there was a man convicted of murder who was sentenced to death. Now, there were mitigating circumstances, and many felt the man was justified in the killing. His lawyers worked frantically to get him a stay of ex execution and a pardon. Shortly before the date of his execution, the governor of the state granted the lawyer's request and issued a pardon. Now, here's where it gets bad. However, the man refused the pardon. The lawyers examined the law and found that a pardon must be accepted by the prisoner, and because the man refused the pardon, he was executed on schedule. This man was offered grace, but he refused it. Are we going to do that? I hope not. It's the same thing with God's grace. It must be accepted by the guilty party. The grace of God works in three areas. On Romans 3, 23 through 28, we read that a while ago. It's past. He brought salvation. Man on his own in the Garden of Eden failed the test. When the first opportunity came, Adam, Adam disobeyed God, not just Adam, <laughs> disobeyed God and did that which was detrimental to himself and to all mankind. That's all of us. 
So you can blame Adam for that. <laughs> yeah. Note that the tree was made with all the rest. You know, the tree was good. There was nothing wrong with it. But God commanded Adam not to eat of the fruit or it would be detrimental to him. Now, God wanted Adam. He warned Adam, but in his unbelief, did not trust God in this matter. He ate the fruit knowing of God's prohibition and command not to eat it. The sin was not committed until Adam took the fruit and ate it. And thus, here we are. <laughs> All right. Thus, God already knowing that Adam and Eve would sin, showed his mercy and grace, and in grace promised the Redeemer to save them from their willing act of sin. And everybody knows who the Redeemer is. That was Jesus. There you go. 2,000 years ago, Jesus the Christ, God incarnate in man, came to earth and he lived, suffered, and died the sin, for the sins of the world. That is the message of the cross. On the cross, Jesus paid the sin debt of the world. He took on himself the penalty of our sins. He being God submitted himself to death that man by faith could have everlasting life. Ooh, praise Jesus. Everybody praise Jesus. You bet. Colossians 2, 13 and 14 say that, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us our trespasses. By canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. All right, think. Well, Colossians 1, 19 and 20 says, For him in all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in, in, or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Whew. Jesus did all that for us. Think, when Adam ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, God said he would die. Not only physical death, but spiritual death, which means separation from God in the eternal punishment of the lake of fire. Yet in the past, before we were even born, before any of us was even thought about, Jesus conquered both sin and death on the cross for us. Presently, grace is at work offering full salvation to all who would accept it, Further, it is at work in a believer's life enabling him to live according to God's word to us. And also God's grace keeps the believer saved. Second Corinthians uh, 1, 21 and 22 says, And it is God who enables us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Yeah. Now in the future, grace ensures our position and place with God in heaven. Grace. And it works on a believer's life, enabling him to live according to God's word to us. And also God's grace keeps the believer saved. Now, the grace of God, who is a person of the Lord Jesus, guarantees our place in heaven and makes us righteous in the eyes of God, thus qualifying through Christ's re re righteousness for us to go there. 1 Peter 5.10 says that, after you have suffered a little while, the, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. God's plan of salvation was, is through grace. That's the way it's supposed to be. Now, salvation is the word soteros. It is the instrumentative case noting it is the object of grace. 
the construction of the sentence shows us that salvation is the object of God's grace. Thus, the object and purpose of grace of God is that man be saved. You know, what do we mean by saved? It's a New Testament term that is used 57 times in the New Testament. Jesus was the first to use the term in John 3, 16 and 17 when he said that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. John 5, 34 also says, Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these, these things so that you may be saved. You may be saved. John 10, 9 says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now everything I've read you from John three sixteen through John 10, 9, is all in red. So you know that's, that's the words of Jesus. Straight from Jesus, okay? The definition and act of grace itself precludes that salvation is not an act of man or of man cooperating with God. You can't, you can't get grace any other way except God gives it to you freely, completely. All right, Romans... 11.5 and 6 says, so, so too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So you can't work for it. You just got to have it. God says, I'll give it to you. You just got to take it. Romans 5, 15, 19, and 21 teaches us that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. It says so, ooh, wait a minute, here, 15, wouldn't it? Yeah. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, Adam's, much more would have the grace of God and free, free gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. So one man put us here and one man took us out. That's good. For by one man's disobedience that many were made sinners. So we were all made sinners by Adam's disobedience. And one man, uh, obedience, then the many were made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. All right, so that as sin resigned in death, grace also reigns through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, Hebrews 4, 16 says that let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That tells you that those that mistakenly try to earn or work for their salvation have no such promise. They can never know if they are worthy or have done enough to please God. Salvation is not earned or worked for. It's a freely given gift of God. The truth is that apart from grace, no man can please God. God imports grace and man receives it in faith. Therefore, showing salvation is by grace is grace by faith. Now Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is, able, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we were, yet without sin. That was Jesus. He came to earth and did it all. Now in Hebrews 4.14 we're backing up. You notice we're going backwards on this, huh? 
says that since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confessions. It, it is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, impersonal relationships is a mark of a false religion. They always put something or someone between you and Jesus Christ personally. There was little or nothing personal in the Jewish Old Testament system of worship. One went to the priest who made the sacrifices for the worshiper. And what a tragedy that some of our churches today teach that works save and that man must go through a priest or a prophet or some other religious leader to find grace. They put Christians in this age under the burden of impersonal law. We're not under impersonal law. That is hearsay, heresy, and not taught anywhere in God's word. We are not under law. Romans 4.4 4 says, Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. In other words, your works that you do for Jesus, not going to get you in heaven, but they will give you treasures in heaven. Okay? Hebrews is addressing the problem of Christian Jews who were warning in their faith and wanting to return to the Old Testament system. Now Hebrews 2, 17 and 18 say, Therefore he had made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make prohibition, uh, pro I can't say it, propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself had suffered with tempt and was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. This is the personal hand of God in our daily lives. It, depend, it shows our dependence on him. Catch that, everybody. Our dependence on him. Okay? And his willingness and will that we be totally dependent on him. Let's see. Totally dependent on him. We, need, we, we should be that way. The grace of God calls pastors and each of us in the service would have for him. Now, God's grace will call you for whatever you're supposed to do for him. Ephesians 3, 7 was, is talking about Paul, where he was called. Let's see if I got it here. Yep. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. And uh, he was called by the grace of God. Galatians 1.15 says, But when he who had set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace. So he called Paul before he was ever born. Ephesians 4, 7 says, By grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And verse 11 says, He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the works of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Grace to keep us saved and give us all the joys of heaven. Ephesians 2, 7 says it's so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasur immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. And i got to restate this. God's mercy keeps us from getting what we deserve. And God's grace of God. It is a blessed hope 
How empty is the false gospel of the cults? If anybody's ever heard of any of these cults around here, their false gospel is way out in the left field. Let me ask y'all a few questions. Are you partakers of the grace of God receiving his free offer of salvation? Yes. Amen. Good. Christian, are you living by grace of God, coming boldly to the throne of grace daily? Yes. Amen. Are you taking heart and comfort, drawing strength from our Lord's sure promise of heaven and his presence to come? Amen. Amen. Good. And this one last thing, if you're not, by the grace of God, you can at this moment or any other moment receive the gift of salvation and live in the blessing of his grace. And there's one thing I want to tell you. So many people have a problem to confess their faith. They're afraid to say anything to anybody and come up and let me read you something. Romans 10, 11 says that for the scripture says... Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. So you, you'll never be ashamed to say, <laughs> I've been saved by God. He's my Savior. Anybody say, everybody say that. I've been saved by God. He's my Savior. There you go. Like I said, this is a short message, but I tell you, it's a powerful one. Take it home with you. If you took any notes and got those scriptures, they're very good. Okay, everybody, let's close your eyes and bow your heads. Does anybody need anything today? You need salvation? Do you need to be prayed for? Anything? If you do, just come forward right now. And we'll pray, Lord. Just be with each and every one of us today. And, Lord, cleanse our hearts and put the spirit of conviction in our hearts, the ones that need it. In the whole world, Lord, we lift up the whole world to you. Every man, every woman, every child in this whole world, we lift them up to you for your salvation, Lord. Just put the spirit of conviction in their hearts and just reveal yourself to them in a greater way. Lord, let them get to know you more intimately. And Lord, just bless each and every one of them and us and all with your grace and your presence daily and lord may we all become pleasing to you and bring honor to your great and powerful name lord and lord thank you for all you do for us in your precious name we pray amen